Hi, I'm Kurt. And on today's episode of Grandworks, I'm going to build a video editing Hackintosh in as few steps as possible, all with no arcane plist or config file editing. Is that even possible? Stay tuned. My current video editing rig is a Mac Mini circa 2012, and well, it's just not cutting it anymore. Unfortunately, new Macs that are powerful enough are either the wrong form factor or are far, far too expensive. So I'm gonna try the Hackintosh route again. This build is mildly higher end, but with notable compromises where necessary. Every component is vetted beforehand to ensure Hackintosh compatibility, no matter what. I start with a Gigabyte GAZ270X UD3 motherboard, paired with an Intel Core i7-7700 KB Lake CPU and cooled by a Noctua NHD14. It has 16 gigabytes of DDR4-2400 RAM in one stick for future expandability. The video card is an MSI GeForce GTX 1070 Ti Titanium. It's all installed in a Fractal Design R5 case and powered by a Seasonic SS660 XP2 80 Plus Platinum power supply. Storage is handled by a 1TB Samsung 850 EVO SSD for the Hackintosh part, a 275GB Crucial MX300 SSD for a dual boot Windows installation, and a 6TB Western Digital Gold 7200RPM Dinosaur Drive for bulk storage. Oh, and not featured here, an IO Gear USB Bluetooth 4.0 micro adapter because, well, why not? This is a macOS High Sierra installation off of a USB flash drive configured via UniBeast from the Tony Mac 86 folks. I wanted to see just how few steps I had to take to get a fully working system. So with that in mind, I didn't go into the BIOS setup at all, thus ensuring that whatever factory default settings were in play remained in play. A Hackintosh install differs from a typical Mac install at first only by the fact that you need to manually format the drive. I'm not 100% certain why, since the High Sierra installation will reformat it into APFS anyway, but you do. The majority of the installation after this is stock macOS install. Really, the only difference is that you need to make sure that you choose the internal HFS drive in Clover during the reboots. While we're waiting, I do want to talk about my component choices a bit. The Fractal Design R5 is a very highly rated, super easy to work with, notably expandable and supposedly very quiet case. I will say post installation that it rattles and buzzes far more than I thought it would. Part of that is the front case fan, which I eventually just disabled entirely. I got the version with the glass side panel just because it was available via Amazon Prime and was actually cheaper than the solid black panel version. I have zero interest in the RGB lighting realm, so glass or not makes no difference to me. The power supply is a Seasonic 660 watt modular unit. 660 watts is ample for my build so that its fan should rarely have to turn on. I wanted a modular design to help with cable management and airflow. And Seasonic is really class leading when it comes to power supplies, so you can't go wrong with them. Gigabyte makes the most Hackintosh compatible motherboards and this particular one supports both USB 3.1 Type-C and M.2 NVMe PCIe Gen 3. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Uh, just in case I use either in the future. The CPU is a 7700 for two reasons. First, I actually thought I ordered a 7700K, but apparently pressed the wrong button and didn't realize it until after it's delivered. Second, I didn't return it because I realized that I'd rather have the 30 watt energy savings on idle rather than a few megahertz in performance, which I likely wouldn't notice anyway. In that vein, the Coffee Lake generation is just too new to guarantee that it would all work. And well, its in increased price doesn't quite justify the somewhat minor day-to-day -day performance gains. So the 7700 hits all the right buttons for performance, price, energy, and compatibility. The cooler is a Noctua NHD14, mostly to give me some breathing room if I did upgrade to an overclockable CPU later. Every review I've seen says that it's notably better at cooling than water-cooled systems and quieter to boot. Ugly comes at no extra charge. Memory is only 16 gigabytes because, well, RAM is ungodly expensive at the moment. Plus, I've never historically needed more than 16 gigabytes. I did get the 16 gigabytes in one stick of RAM just to give myself a little more room to breathe if memory prices go down in the future and I do decide to get more. Memory is memory for all practical purposes, so I just got a reasonably priced stick from a reputable manufacturer and didn't really stress about timings and whatnot. I wanted an external GPU mostly for gaming on the Windows side, but why not use it on the Hackintosh side too? 
Nvidia is a solid choice because while the latest AMD GPUs are very competitive, they aren't anywhere near as transparently compatible with Hackintoshes. Plus, they are hard to find due to their popularity of mining cryptocurrencies. So the only real question is which Nvidia card to buy. I did a lot of research on this, but to make a very long story short, the 1070 Ti hit all of the right compromises. The 1080 and up want too much money for too little gains, and anything below, well, gave up too much performance. The 1070 Ti is a powerhouse available at a nominal price and is fully compatible with Hackintoshes. What's not to like? I got the MSI variant because it's known to be very quiet, with fans that are off when the load is low. Nice. I originally planned to get the Samsung 960 EVO NVMe SSD, but the same DRAM shortage that's causing the RAM prices to skyrocket is also affecting the NVMe drives. I wasn't willing to spend twice the amount of money to go NVMe when its day-to-day -day performance over SATA isn't going to be noticeable. There would be a few cases where the staggering NVMe speeds would come into play, but again, not enough to justify the huge price difference. Maybe next year I'll get a smaller scratch drive or something. I also got a separate SSD for my dual boot Windows installation because, well, it's easier that way. And my choice of a Western Digital Gold as the bulk drive is mostly because of the 7200 RPM speed and a little bit because of the notable warranty increase compared to the blue. I might get more of them and set up a RAID drive at some point in the future. Everything supports it, so we'll see. All told, this slid in at just under $2,000, which is what my target was. It's a system that is substantially more powerful than my 2012 Mac Mini, while still far, far cheaper than the equivalent new Macs. And it's all guaranteed to work as a Hackintosh. Okay, back to the install in progress. It's completely unremarkable in just how identical it is to the official Mac install. I do create a special install account mostly because I want to do a migration for my existing Mac later, and well, that has the names I want. And voila, here we are, a working macOS High Sierra desktop without doing anything at all notably special. Quite a bit more works out of the box than I expected. Audio works, and so does Ethernet networking. Video kinda works too, although it's not very usable. There are visible artifacts on web pages, and anything that moves on the screen takes up a lot of CPU. The resolution is pretty bad too. So let's spiff this up with the first real Hackintosh only step in the install. I'll use MultiBeast to do everything since it's by far the easiest method available. You don't need to know much of anything, which I guess is both good and very bad. Anyway, we want a non-legacy system base. Moving on to audio, I found that the Voodoo HDA to work best with this motherboard. There is explicit support for ALC 1220, which is what is actually on the board, but I found it to be very flaky in my testing. I do choose the Intel generic AHCI SATA just for a better system profiling labels, because why not? And then the best ethernet controller, as far as I can tell, is the latest Mousy driver. USB support requires just the third party bits and the increased port limit for our 200 series motherboard. It's 200 series because it's the Z270 chipset. And now this step is actually very critical. The default bootloader will not work with the NVIDIA drivers or with Apple messages. You absolutely must choose the UEFI boot mode plus emulated NVRAM. Since this motherboard does not support native NVRAM and NVIDIA drivers require it, as do the Apple messages. So this is non-optional. For video, all we need is the NVIDIA web drivers boot flag since everything else really refers to older cards. And as far as system identification goes, the iMac 14,2 is the default, and it does work. But might as well choose 18,3, which is a 2017 iMac with an i7-7700K, <laughs> which is essentially what the system actually is. So yeah, let's choose that. While Clover is installing, let's move on to installing the NVIDIA web drivers. I previously downloaded them and put them on install flash drive. There's a link in the doobly-doo. That's not actually the newest version of the driver at the time of this video though. Each version of the driver is tied to a super specific version of the OS. 
You can find out which one you have by looking at the system profiler and the software section. In my case, it is 17C88. The 103 version of the NVIDIA driver requires 17C89, so I need a version 102. You'll want to verify your version as well. Installation of the drivers is pretty standard. It requires a reboot to complete. Multibus does as well, so might as well do both at the same time. While we're at it, might as well go into the BIOS for the first time to actually change the boot order. That way we can use the Clover loader on the internal drive rather than the USB flash drive or the default Windows boot loader. Ta-da! We have a fully working High Sierra desktop. The NVIDIA drivers are giving me full resolution and performance. I can see the Voodoo HDA drivers populating the audio bits. Word of the wise though, the names Voodoo HDA gives doesn't always persist between reboots. Also, the Voodoo HDA preference pane sometimes allows you to configure all of the audio lines and sometimes only the HDMI ones. I don't know why. I exclusively use USB audio in the form of my Blue Yeti, so I don't really care enough to dig deep. It all works so perfectly that it's almost anticlimactic. I never made any special BIOS changes and the stall steps were super straightforward, with no need to edit a single plist or config file. It blows me away just how easy installing Hackintoshes can be now, compared to the last time I did it, circa 2011 or so. That was a massive pain back then. After capturing this video, I wiped the entire system and did a full backup from Time Machine from my old Mac Mini. So I've been using this Hackintosh as my daily driver for a week now, and it's also what I produce this very video on. I'm loving it. Okay, a few small caveats. Messages does work, but it doesn't sync with my iPhone quite as automatically as my Mac Mini did. That is, messages that I send exclusively on my iPhone sometimes, but sometimes don't show up actually in the Messages app. Everything that shows up in Messages does show up on my iPhone though. Kind of weird. Handoff isn't working at all. I likely need a wireless card for that, but I've never really used that feature, so I don't care enough to find out. And the NVIDIA driver does cause some very odd graphic glitches on older games like Star Wars Force Unleashed, but that might not be Hackintosh specific. It's otherwise awesome. So if you were wanting to see just how easy a Hackintosh install could be, well, now you know. It's even easier than installing Windows. And as always, thanks for watching.